Welcome everyone to another episode of the Questioning Podcast, where we look at how the um, process of questioning can affect positively your life in various professions, and it's just a cool thing to do. So, and this time I'm joined, I actually <laughs> didn't check that, uh, I, uh, to make sure I pronounce your name right. So I'll try though, and you can correct me. So Philip Castagner? Castagnier. Castagnier, oh, that's nice. That's, but that's I, I've heard so many versions of it that uh, it's, it's not a problem. You should hear what they say in the Czech Republic. <laughs> oh, yeah. You are a professional opera singer. Yes. Yeah, I mm. sing. Well, I, I was until uh, like three weeks ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because of COVID-19. <laughs> yeah. So now everything is shut down. And we're, right. now I'm a professional, uh, I'm a professional waiter because I just wait. Ah, uh, wait for her. <laughs> Got it. Literally, like. <laughs> um, uh, I usually don't like to go too much into the kind of background and everything because you know it can get a bit tedious. Uh, but I also want to make sure that people know that you know you you absolutely have credibility. You know what you're talking about. Uh, so maybe you could just for a moment tune down humbleness and say a few kind of cool facts about your. Um, your experience like you did this and that so people would be like oh he's a cool guy is, is that an okay yeah thing? So, yeah so uh i studied um i studied opera in university like a lot of um uh, voice students do a lot of aspiring opera singers mm. and i was kind of a, a prodigy if you will oh, so i was snap nice <laughs> I, I was uh, um I hit about uh, 20 years old, and then I was like the star tenor guy in my school. Uh, mm. That's the high voice uh, male singers. Mm. And I entered an international competition. That's sort of the one for, especially for North American singers, called the mm. Metropolitan Opera National Council audition. Mm. And uh, that's an international competition, and I won. Mm. Um, and I was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty young, or, and oh, especially at the time, was, was quite young yeah. um, for, for winning that. Um, and then I was invited by the Metropolitan Opera to be a young artist in their uh, training program, which is like a, an apprentice program for uh, young artists. Pretty exclusive. There were maybe like 10 or 12 of us in, in the program. Um, and there you're, you're basically paid to live in New York and study singing. Mm. Um, and then I got all the fantastic opportunities from the Metropolitan Opera. Um, did uh, quite a few performances on stage there. Um, and about um, eight or 10 years later, uh, everything with my voice stopped working very well. Um, and I was getting fewer and fewer jobs. Uh, and a few yeah, years later, yeah, got it. You were, you were going yeah, actually, to. Yeah, I just wanted to, to quickly ask. Uh, um, I, I'm intending to kind of dig down and dig a bit deeper into your, your whole journey and story a bit later in the conversation, um, maybe after we, we talk about the pressure testing. But, but one thing I wanted to just double check. Uh, so something literally happened with your voice or? Well, uh, that's the way people often frame it. Um, but uh, really, I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, oh. I, I just really had no idea how my voice worked and how my body worked and Jeez. how it all related because mm -hmm. I was taught by either people who failed at it themselves um, or people who never actually knew how to sing yeah. themselves. So it was not uh, uh pressure tested if you will yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the methods were were often i would compare them to like traditional martial arts you know it was uh, kind of um expecting things to work without ever putting yourself under the gun and and, yeah. and testing it out yeah. um and uh then actually, when I was, do you mind if i jump yeah. in for a moment that's sure. because uh, I was intending to go into questions, but it's just fascinating to me what you're saying. And uh, one thing that I was always interested in is, and because I went kind of through that 
myself, not obviously with singing, I don't know how to sing, but with the experience where when you're successful at something, but you're not 100% sure why, uh, it just kind of falls into place. You maybe do the work and everything, but, but I think that's maybe part of the j danger of being talented or you know, prodigy or whatever. Uh, but like when you get things quite easily to a degree and you just kind of wing it and you do it and it works. And I think eventually there's a huge problem when you, gr you keep grinding and you reach that moment where you have to replicate what you did, but you're not sure exactly what parts and elements were responsible for that. And for me, that was actually when I was running my Aikido school, the first year was amazing. Like people were just like blown away and I had such a hu huge enthusiasm from my students. But then I guess the grind came and some other elements in my life and, and I started to feel like the morale was dropping and I wasn't sure. I was like, what did I do then that worked so well? And I tried to replicate it, but it took me a long time to understand. I'm still figuring out actually up to this day what I did right and what I did wrong. But then initially I, I guessed the wrong things oftentimes. I was like, oh, almost not, not like, I'll, I'll make this as a joke, but it's like, oh, I wore that orange t-shirt. Maybe that was it, you know. Just not, not really like that, but kind of that level. So, so it seems like the same applies to singing. Was that a little bit it, like that for you? Yeah, it was a it was a very similar thought process and a very similar kind of course of events. Mm. Um, the the way I put it now, I, I came up with with a system for basically how to train yourself in singing and how to maintain yourself in singing, and I use an analogy called the castle made of sand. Mm. And uh, the castle made of sand is is the idea that whatever it is you've accomplished mm. at any point, yeah, it's just it's just a castle made of sand. Mm -hmm. And you can either go about trying to convince everyone that it's made out of something more solid mm. uh, by people do things like um, well, they can become voice teachers, for instance, and now they control the environment. And when they control the environment, they can try to make that castle made of sand look like it's a lot more solid than it actually is. Mm. Because they're not really under pressure, especially the emotional and environmental pressure that professional singers are under. Mm. Um, and you can either just get really depressed about it or try to spend your time kind of fixing the sand castle. Mm. Or you can make a decision, you know what, I'm going to get good at making sandcastles. Mm. And then you're always in the process of starting over. And it's not a big deal when your castle starts to fall apart. You're, you're mm. a little bit used to it. It's, it's, it's never not a deal. It's never not a thing. It's always a little bit disconcerting when you go to execute something and you expect it to just happen. You're used to not thinking about it. And now you have to think about it. Mm. Um, and at the same time, the singer's body is constantly changing. Mm. Uh, your hormonal situation is changing. Your, um, your cartilage, your whole life is gradually turning into bone. So everything about it is, is constantly in flux. Mm. And if you are not ready for that process, you're probably going to fail mm. at some point. Mm. Well, that kind of naturally makes me ask uh, so how is it in the world of singing in terms of mm, delivering that uh, that information uh, and maybe I'll actually just add this piece of information to kind of get a context for the whole audience uh, I probably didn't say that on record before that my girlfriend right now is she's a professional singer or she's kind of she had like a huge success and then now she's working her way back up so it's a whole story as well, but being with her for the past like nine or eight, eight months, I kind of started to get a bit of a feel for how the world of music works. And, and it's very different from what I thought. Maybe not like very different, but a lot of things surprised me. Uh, I was surprised. And then it kind of started to make sense to me when I learned about it. I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's everywhere. But I do have to admit that before I simplified it, I thought, yeah, you know, you're, you're a good singer, you make a good song and then that's it. And it just seems like it's, it's actually chaotic and it's it's a tough world out there and and she specifically is she teaches singing sometimes to, to some of the people around her and so she's enthusiastic about it and I learned from her as well like like a lot of people don't apparently they don't really know what singing is about or, or she was frustrated with some of her teachers 
that they weren't really capable of explaining or fully understanding what they're doing and, and how they're doing, why they're doing, and they weren't able to relate that. So I was interested because you 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 were all over the world and you were in these big places, and I'm sure you have so much experience. Uh, is that like would you say a huge problem that the world is um, you know that there's a so I'll just focus that, that the thought so that the world of singing in terms of teaching and passing on the knowledge that sometimes it's it's kind of a vague area when the work started drying up and uh, I, I was not 22 anymore 26 27 28 it occurred to me that the training I thought I had was more like a mining process where uh, rather than really knowing about how to develop artists and how to develop singers they just kind of put you through a filter and the ones who can figure out how to survive the filter so, so in spite of the training you survive then you might go on and, and have a career um, yeah. and when I was uh, about 35 I'm 41 now and I was 35 years old and trying to come back and I remember going to to Germany and doing some auditions and they just straight up told me I was too old so like no nobody expected 35 to go somewhere whereas 50 years ago they would say things like well the voice doesn't really mature until about your early 40s oh, okay. um, so 50 years ago I would be considered in my prime now and but then five years ago <laughs> I was considered washed up. Um, and that seems to be the ways that that it's evolved. So it's like there there's pressure, but it's not pressure testing a learning process, if you will. It's just pressure testing your overall ability, your yeah. genetics almost. So it's a little bit like they're going in the mine and they're breaking up the rocks and looking for the diamond. <laughs> and it's... Yeah. They do find some amazing people this way, I have to say, you know, that there's, but um, when you're not one of the diamonds, it's not so great. <laughs> For sure. You know, we're, we're both uh, practicing martial arts and uh, also to the competitive ones. And maybe not everyone is, who's listening to this podcast is necessarily into it, but I, I see there's a huge parallel for me as well when I look back into the history of MMA uh, that initially it was kind of let's throw these guys into the cage, different sizes and whatnot, and the best one will come out. And I think you know it was it was a mess, and uh, and I think it was the same like you said, like the training from what I heard. Obviously, I guess I was a bit too young for that back then, but from the stories I heard, that that was like the training was very much like just tough guys coming in, kind of Fight Club, you know, if you watch the movie. Yeah, I remember the the Savat guy. In the, it was UFC one. And uh, there was a Savat guy, and his opponent was so big that he just broke his hand on the on the opponent. Yeah. It was a, like a sumo yeah. guy or something like that. And so yeah, I think and I think so. But but even like the training as well, especially when yeah, MMA UFC became popular and MMA started becoming popular, there was no clear methodology back then to know how to get people from point zero to point, you know, fighting. And now these days, still there's some schools which are like that. You know, it's just a bunch of alpha males jumping in and, and bashing each other. And the, and the tough ones who are naturally gifted, they, they survive there and, and they keep on developing without knowing actually what they're doing. But, uh, but the, there's no space for others. While, while luckily there are gyms, more and more of them, and that's the ones I prefer, where there's a very smart methodology. And now they know like how to get, how to develop anyone like and it doesn't mean like a person who's completely let's say untalented i hate actually that word but let's say a person who's just not fit he, he doesn't have the right body and etc i think still, i still think he can make well, it like big me. oh you are <laughs> you'd say yeah. uh, oh you mean like in martial arts sense or yeah, in martial arts. okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah but then again yeah, there, there's so many people like that that are not born fighters but still with the right teaching and the right dedication Right now, there's enough, if you find a good coach, there's enough knowledge and methodology to get you there and you can achieve probably incredible things. Or even if you're like mediocre, you can become like super good. It's not just based on that, but but that that pathway has to be developed. And, and why I do like 
mixed martial arts is because of the same phrase that we'll repeat today quite a few times, that's pressure testing. You know, it's like you do, if you're, if you have at least a bit of uh, in intelligence, you will easily and quickly start to see what works and what doesn't work. The pressure testing is so big that you'll easily start to see what doesn't work and you just throw away and you start to see what works and you ask how and, and that really, I think, helps, that helped the MMA game evolve to such great heights. Like if you'll compare, I don't want to go too far into martial arts, but, but just the last thought that if you compare the first UFC or even the Gracies, you know, who won the first UFC, they, if they would now compete against a, almost like a medial core Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy, probably he would bash them because the game evolved so much during such a short time. So, so I guess it's a little bit similar with the Yeah, I there. think so. Do you see some parallels? Um, and, I, you know, I have to say that the other, like, when it, I box and no intention of competing. Um, yeah. It's just, it's the training. But still, because of the methodology, um, I, I've done things now that I just didn't think were possible. Or, and, well, see, at first I thought, I, when I walked in, I thought I could do them already. Um, because I had trained in something called Wing Chun, um, which is a kind of uh, Chinese patty cake. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and I thought, oh, well, I'll have some skills, so I'll have a little bit of a, a of an advantage. So first, it was just a really rude awakening, finding out that I was the worst guy in the class, maybe not even because of any natural restrictions uh, from my body or genetics or anything but because of what i had learned i, I was i'll just quickly yeah. very quickly i'll just jump in this yeah. and i'll let you continue but that thought that it's it's one of the potential conclusions i came to as well and i, I spoke to some people who who think that as well like that tra traditional martial arts such as like Vinci or aikido can actually make you worse at fighting because you have all those developed heavily developed habits which are counterintuitive and they don't really work and so I guess that that was kind of your experience. That was exactly my experience. I I remember being really um, it, it was for me like absolute dogma um, that you always go forward and never back because they had drilled that <laughs> in, into us yeah, in true. in the Wing Chun class, and it's just a it's like the weakest bull in a china shop. That it's like a bull in a china shop but the china is made out of bulls and the bull is made out of china <laughs> so um and the, the first class was actually not a, a traditional boxing class western boxing it was a kickboxing class and wasn't a very good instructor and so he had me sparring in the second uh, class which i was not ready for in any way and i charged a guy who had like 100 pounds on me uh, and he just kind of lifted his leg and broke my rib. And oh. so, so that was uh, like two and a half months off of, or three months off, I think, from pursuing any kind of physical culture. Um, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to do a little bit more research. And I did, and I, and I found um, a boxing gym with a qualified instructor. He's... He's actually, he's a purple belt, uh, no, a brown belt uh, jiu-jitsu, um, and it's an MMA gym with a boxing class. Nice. Um, cool. So I just did the boxing class, and in that class, I, I, I first found out, uh, I, I knew already a little bit that my Wing Chun stuff had put me at risk. Um, so I was very humble walking in, um, and I remember just wondering how the hell anyone ever ducks a punch and, and I remember tr like trying to plan it out ahead of time uh, because everything in Wing Chun is kind of planned out ahead of time you know um, there's a little bit of faux uh, uh, sparring I guess this um, Chi Sao yeah but it's all a really uh, it's like a rehearsed pattern um, and uh, and one day I ducked a punch and I know that that doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like anything to most people but to me it it really changed my attitude about myself and and, and what I could do um, 
and the next time I went on stage, I was a lot more fearless than than I was before. So yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, again, I uh, I'm intent. I'm kind of trying not to go too much into martial arts, but I guess it's a little bit inevitable. Uh, so I'll just try to say this briefly. But but for me, that was as well like my experience that I was surprised how much confidence martial arts like martial arts and to be clear especially for people who know my journey aikido did not really give me confidence when i switched aikido into more competitive martial arts uh combat sports then and i realized i can handle myself and i would deal with actual pressure etc 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 then uh, i was surprised by how much confidence that gave me and i was confident on some level already but still the confidence was boosted in all of the situations and uh, I'm, I'm, it's just cool to hear that also that applied to you in uh, singing in your profession like that there, there was that relationship there as well. Yeah. And it, it, it was that, and you know, all of a sudden I found, I could talk to girls. Um, it was just, um, I, I stopped being so afraid of conflict. Right. Yeah. And a strange result is that I started to have less conflict in my life because I wasn't afraid of conflict anymore. It opened up a lot of opportunities for me to be kind when before I had to be defensive. Right. Yeah. And so it, yeah, it's, it's really, I guess it's something I recommend everyone should do some kind of, it, um, it doesn't need to be MMA. I, I think, um, it probably should be <laughs> for, for most people. Um, I had to really think about being um my age and the and trying to balance the physical demands of and of martial arts training and the recovery process from when you when you train with my singing schedule uh i remember going on uh after one particularly it was just boxing class but he made us do a whole lot of squats and burpees in that class and i had a show the next night and my legs were barely working and it was my my conductor asked me if i was sick or something you know like what what so i had to i also had to learn about managing that and and um you know i'm human i can't just go all out on everything um, and um so i i mean on, t on top of the confidence not that i think i could get in a street fight and not get hurt i'm i'm really sure now that if I ever did get into a street fight, I probably would get severely injured. Um, else. <laughs> yeah, but before I, I had the, this fantasy that, you know, I could take on three guys with my patty yeah, cake, yeah, yeah. you know, it's slap them with my chain punches or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, I, I, I learned about so many things and it started to feed into a philosophy of singing um, that thinks about developing the, the whole person. So normally in singing, from the first day, they teach you that your voice is an instrument. And about, you know, it was about 16 years after I had started to become a student of singing, it, it occurred to me well, actually, there's there's no instrument. It's just you, um, and like literally, um, like anything that's an instrument, it's it's like something you know you can hold, and a, lo a lot of languages have like special grammar for instruments, um, and the point of an instrument is it isn't you, it's some kind of implement that you can. You know, it's it's externalized, and uh, the, this thing isn't going to change. You know, if you play the guitar, you have to tune the guitar and stuff, but you're not going to wake up one day and the guitar is sick. Uh, and you're not going to step on stage with with a, with a guitar that's completely solid, and then the moment the guitar realizes everybody's watching it starts to get all soft and can't stay in tune. You know, that's, that's not a thing, but in martial arts and, and in singing that does 
happen. So I, I, yeah. I, I've never been in a professional match, but I imagine that you experienced the, the uh, I've seen um, your amateur matches and I've seen you uh, talk about it after. And there's this common experience where it's like your level just drops from the environment. Um, sure. and, and you have this feeling like, no, but if only you guys could see what I can really do. Uh, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't me. That's not my level. But that is your level in that in that environment, you know, and that's that's what you've been training for. Um, oh, you're freezing up a little bit. Oh, uh, nope. I can hear you, please. No, nope. okay. Yeah. So, and and that's part of the kind of the wisdom of pressure testing, I guess, is is that there's different kinds of pressure. So w when you're in MMA or boxing class, it's like okay, you might start with just the movement just uh, okay here's a jab you know here's a here's a straight uh, right or straight left for me you know one two one two you learn that and then as soon as you have someone in front of you who's moving around or something like that or even just with the pads it's a little bit harder and and it falls apart a little bit and then you, so then you work on it and then when someone's trying to hit you it really falls apart, you know, and it's like, oh, I didn't realize I would stop breathing <laughs> as soon as I got into a situation where someone's putting me under pressure. Um, and the, the same thing happens to you in singing when, when you step out there on the stage. So that kind of naturally uh, leads me into one of the main questions I wanted to bring up, and that's pressure testing in singing. That's uh, something I didn't actually thought about consciously myself before, although it makes sense. But you were the, the, the first person to introduce that concept to me. And uh, I became very excited about that and like a quick story for why. And now I'm pursuing in my new journey, I'm pursuing to kind of try to create some influence, positive influence outside of martial arts. But for me, that was always important. And when I was having my martial arts journey, I always, one of the best moments for me wasn't when people gave me some good comments about my martial arts stuff, but it was when somebody would, let's say, write a comment, oh, I don't do martial arts, but your video inspired me. I was like, yes, that's what I want. I want that influence to spread. So when you uh, told me about using some of the concepts of pressure testing in singing, I was like, just so happy about that. So, but we never like in depth spoke about that. And uh, I wanted to just ask you more about, so what, what is that whole uh, subject about pressure testing in singing yeah well you can observe it in in a few ways um one thing to be aware of is that everyone has this tendency to go the other way so to remove the pressure you see a lot of of like uh, voice training exercises and things that are designed to help you succeed your next attempt and then they go ah so you made progress but all you really did was make it easier for you to do the next thing you were about to do. So to give an example, there's a lot of um, exercises. I don't call them exercises really, but um, where you kind of sing through a straw. And it has a particular effect that we don't need to get into That's some technical voice stuff. But then you'll go to sing after you take the straw out of your mouth and it'll be easier. Um, and that can be a good opportunity to say, learn a new coordination because everything you do in singing, whatever style you're singing is a specific coordination, just like, uh, you know, a jab, uh, one, two is a specific coordination. And, uh, if you do a step jab, that's a different coordination. Or if you, um, and, and BJJ, all your things that the specific techniques are doing require a kind of specific coordination and certain things you have to be aware of. Um, and there is this old motor learning dogma called the optimal control hypothesis. And the optimal control hypothesis says that you, you kind of, you're, you're, you have this muscle memory and your, your body learns how to perform things in certain ways. And there's channels you want, and then there's other channels you don't want. And if you 
do it enough times in the channel you want and you avoid the channels you don't want, you will establish an optimal control. Just to make sure I follow you correctly, uh, can you say, specify what you mean by channel? Yeah, so every movement problem, um, every uh, all motor learning has a pro problem built in called um, it's uh, called degrees of freedom. So if you want to throw a jab, there's a there's, and it, it needs to go straight away from your face and then straight back towards your face and you know that's a, a simple description of a, of a of a jab. But your body can move has more degrees of freedom than that. So if you were like on rails or something in a robot that only moves, you know, or some kind of pneumatic device that can only shoot straight out and come back, no problem. There's no degrees of freedom. So it doesn't need to learn how to do that movement. But when you're talking about a, a coordination like a jab, there are degrees of freedom that if, if you go down those channels, you did your jab wrong. You didn't really have a jab. You had maybe like a bicycle thing that left your face wide open for you yeah. know, getting knocked out. Um, and to solve that problem, something like traditional martial arts, for instance, will do forms. And forms have you do the movement perfectly over and over again. And that's built on the optimal control hypothesis, which is the idea that if you just do it enough times, that's the only way your body knows how to do it now. You've kind of worn a groove uh, into the optimal movement pattern and you've eliminated the other options or you've inhibited them. Um, the only problem is it doesn't work. So, <laughs> Right? Yeah. So, but doing something like these exercises with the straw, for instance, um, can be beneficial, and and so can you know slowly learning how to do your job in the mirror it makes it easier because you can see what you're doing wrong. But from there, you have to start purposefully breaking it. You have to start putting it under pressure so that it fails. Uh, Otherwise, if you rely on the optimal control hypothesis and expect it to take you to a new level, you, you, you will eventually be under pressure and everything's going to break down except you haven't trained for it. Um, and when that's part of the training process, it's healthy. But when that's part of your performance, then it's really detrimental. The audience gets let down and your career goes down the tubes and, and so on. So I'm sure there's more to follow, and I'll, I'll be very interested to, to hear about that. But just to make sure, again, I'm on the same page. So um, I'm figuring out what you're saying, again, in comparison to my experience, yeah. and that's martial arts primarily. So uh, I guess that same example applies if you're training all the time on soft mats, bare feet, uh, specific you know, Japanese outfit. And then when it's competition time, it's shoes on, it's rough surface, uh, unusual obst uh, un unpredictable obstacles, objects around you and different clothing, different lighting. And then you're, you, you get confused and you can't perform the same way because you're used to that environment. So I guess that, that, that middle way would be to train as close as you can. And actually just very quickly, that, that, there's a cool story about that. Uh, you know, I trained with um, coach Don Kavanaugh for a while and one of the very well-known MMA instructors for who, who coaches we don't know. And one of the things, he, he tries to bring his fighters as close as he can to, to the experience of what they will have in the fight. And one of the things uh, he, he sometimes stresses that the octagon he has in his gym is the same size as for a professional fighter and that's like already a plus. And another really cool idea, it's just an idea I guess and you can't like prove it that it works but it's, it's a nice notion he has um, a wallpaper of an audience so that with the idea that people there would be even more stress in the sparring you'd feel like people are watching you so it's just he's doing everything he can to replicate that experience so I guess we're kind of talking about something similar in regards to that lacking part in singing right so the the audience um, in in MMA or in singing introduces um, a kind of stress uh, and also a kind of opportunity, uh, because you, you can kind of ride that wave, you can ride that energy. 
it's the way I like to think about the kinds of stresses because it's it's helpful for me to break things up especially into groups of three um because when i work with groups of two everything becomes kind of black and white um so you, you have um intellectual and you have emotional or spiritual however you want to say them and you have physical challenges um and or you could say uh there's knowledge and ability and heart. So uh, when you're in front of an audience, the one thing that's obvious to most people is the social situation is very different. You're going to have this pressure to perform. They, they might make you nervous. That's going to change your hormones. Um, I think people talk about that a lot, uh, this kind of performance anxiety. Um, but there's also just the visual stimulus. So that this and that is going to catch your eye and and you're going to need brain processing power to either look at it or to not look at it. That's going to it's going to have a cost. It's going to pull your attention away and every time you switch your attention from one thing to another, there's something called switching cost. So um like this is why you can't ever train really to drive while looking at your cell phone safely. Um, because and you're always going to be in a situation where there's a cost from switching your attention from one thing to another um, and you wind up with a kind of blindness to the things you're supposed to be paying attention to um, so that's that seems very smart to have the wallpaper because even though the social situation isn't the same you get used to the wallpaper as you know it doesn't feel like people really um, sure. and the scenario and your, your ego isn't interacting with the wallpaper in the same way, but the visual stimulus is still something. And, and you've, you, you're training with, with, um, with that visual stimulus. And when you get into the ring, there's not going to be such a high cost to just having the sight of people there, you know? fine you can't do anything about the fact that now it's the real now it's go time now it's the performance and you're going to fail or succeed tonight you know and and you can't avoid the feeling that you'll have that you've put so much investment into this and and that one of you is going to lose so even i mean you could even feel hopeful about winning and at the same time, you understand somewhere that that means the other guy lost and everything he invested into that contest is not a waste, but it's going to be, it's, it's, you're going to take it from him. Um, so um, that's a kind of, uh, where were we with the pressure testing? Um, we, we are really rambling. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're, you're good. Well, actually, well, maybe to get us back on track, um, one thing I wanted to ask is, uh, so we're already introducing kind of the idea of pressure testing, but I know that from the interactions we had before that you actually already started implementing methods or experiments with pressure testing, with singing. Uh, you have the group and apparently there's more people involved. So, so how is that working? Can you say more about that? Yeah, so we have a group of about 500 people um and uh that's that's the overall group then there's a smaller core of of really active members that go into small chat rooms and in order to get into the main group we just we basically just let anybody in um but in order to get into the small chat rooms first you go to a special room we call the on ramp and in the on-ramp, you have to sing. You have to sing something for everybody. And if you don't, you don't get past the on-ramp. And actually, if you if you stay there for two weeks or something and you never participate in, we just kick you out of the on-ramp. And probably we never hear from you again, or we give you a chance to, you know, put your big boy pants on and sing something because you say you're a singer. So let's go. And that came from simply going out there and looking on Reddit 
looking on like there's a, a platform called discord where people discuss singing it's um originally made for gamers to sync up their chats with their games and stuff and people go into these things and they don't really sing it's 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 like it's it's mind-boggling like you you went online to get good at singing and then you don't sing and not only that you start taking advice from people who themselves never sing they they make sure never ever ever to demonstrate anything um and and at the same time they devalue the demonstrations of other people so anyone who does demonstrate they will criticize yeah and um in my opinion their objective is not so much to um to to offer a critique it's to offer an obstacle to demonstration right. because they're afraid of a world that includes any kind of pressure on their own abilities i guess it's a little bit uh, i'm jumping in here but shortly yeah. there's a difference between you could say i guess or how i phrase it is there's critique and there's feedback and like there's you know there's just something to tell like you're bad like a punishment uh or uh, something derogatory or feedback is something constructive something that tells you gives you information to work with and the critique there's no follow-up they tell you something bad and that's it and you're like what should i do with this you know it just makes me feel bad and that's it feedback gives you something to work with and i noticed uh, i think probably you're, you're pointing to something similar uh, usually people who give feedback are the ones who went down the path. They, they know how that, that specific part of the journey feels and they know that it's a tough one and they've been there and there's some maybe care, there's some compassion and also wisdom. And that's where they offer feedback. But the first one is usually like from, as you said, like it's from people who probably are very not far by the, down the road, but they're, they're the ones who are eager to just like go and punish anyone. So I guess, is that something similar? Yeah, and they also, there's, there's something you can notice if you pay attention to your internal life when you're, when you're a singer. And that's that when you're, when you're up, you know, when you're feeling kind of dominant, socially dominant, you sing better. Um, actually, your, you know, your hormonal situation improves, like your cortisol probably goes down and all this stuff, and you'll sing better. So I think what they do in part is they get online, they trash somebody, maybe gang up on them and do some bullying. They don't demonstrate there, but then they go and sing for themselves and they sing better and they start to create this image of themselves as kind of the good singer, but it depends on constantly abusing others. And the part they're often not aware of because they haven't actually gone down the path is that every time you step on stage, you're listening. And if you've trained yourself to listen to others with this point of view of looking for, looking for some way to dominate by finding the flaws, by, um, shall we say, you know, you know, in, in boxing, they do these stare downs and in MMA too, they'll have the weigh in and they'll try, they try to psych out their opponent. Um, and that's, I think that's fine and really, really good for, for that because, I mean, it's great to watch and, um, and it's a good way to get an edge on your opponent. But singing is not uh, you against the other people with you on stage. It's to get, it's a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a different kind of thing. And that, but that attitude's gonna turn on someone and it's gonna be you. And you'll, so you'll find yourself wondering why everything is, is breaking down every time you're in front of people and it's self-consciousness and, uh, because you're, you're, you're kind of going around and trying to make others self-conscious. And so, the, so you got technically good at that process of creating self-consciousness. And then when it's your turn, well, what's going to happen? is you're going to unleash that same technique, but on the one target that's available and it's you. Um, so we filter them out, all of these kinds of people by just simply asking them to sing. And so you'd be surprised how many people show up and are expecting to be, 
you know, participating in the normal kind of um, singing discussion online where you you type on your keyboard and try to get somehow create the the impression that you're a great singer without ever singing. Um, and so we just filter them out. And on the other side of this on ramp, you have the people who are willing to share what they do. And the way that we communicate, if, if someone is um, asking about a, a particular problem with singing, and they may be, we have all kinds of genres. So I sing opera, but I also go there to learn other genres uh, just for myself because it, it's enjoyable and it, it, it informs my process in general. Um, and again, because I don't believe in the optimal control hypothesis, I feel like any, any way I can test myself as a singer, even if it doesn't seem related, or just as a person. So boxing or, you know, I've, I've done a few MMA classes. I've, you know, it's, it's any way that I can um, find some kind of culture of myself, you know, as, so as opposed to just looking for places where I naturally dominate, building myself up, I find just little threads that connect everything. And I never know where they're going to be. Um, and uh, so, so we have that process and the way people interact is through singing, which, which sounds crazy. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, it sounds crazy to most people who go online to talk about singing because they're just used to this. It's like traditional martial arts. They're just used to kind of, uh, doing forms, I guess, but even less than that, it's talking about doing forms. <laughs> yeah. And so, so if someone has a problem, then we ask them, well, show us what you mean, like sing it for us. And the way you're expected to give an answer is to sing back and show them what you mean. Now, a quick thing to double check. Uh, Maybe I'm maybe I'm off on this one, but so do you mean like you sing a song, or do you mean like you're singing out what you're saying? Is just wanted to double. So people, so we do this on um, on Facebook Messenger chats, mm -hmm. and the platform right now kind of limits you to one minute on on these voice recordings, mm -hmm. or you can um, kind of record it in voice memo or something and then send a longer one but we tend to have these one minute things yeah. uh, and you can just hit record a few times you know um and so people just sing right into their phones or they might even make a video of what they're doing because oftentimes you know someone wants to see well what is your mouth doing what is your um what is your tongue doing or something like that and so you might sing to me and, and say what it is that you're looking for. Um, and you might show me an example of someone doing it. And then the thing for me to do is to show you how I would do it. And that gives you an opportunity to, to one, uh, see what knowledge goes with what results. At the same time, every time I hit record, I put my own techniques under pressure because you, you know, you think you got it and then you record it to go to show someone and it's like, ah, <laughs> uh, you don't even feel nervous, but the results are there. So it's obvious you have, something has changed. Uh, it can be that you're looking at the phone, you know, it can be that you're used to singing with your hands down and now you're holding the phone to try to sing into it or something like that. Do you mind if I jump in with a question or? Yeah. Hmm. Something I uh, noticed again, and, and you know, I'm new to this world and I'm just trying to figure things out, but something I noticed with my girlfriend that I mentioned before, uh, who's a singer, uh, she has a challenge and difficulty of what I consider to be a challenge and difficulty of wanting to be not necessarily perfect, but, but 
towards that direction. And I'm starting to get that impression that maybe it's a thing that singers have more often than not. I don't know, maybe that's, or I think you, you kind of mentioned that a little bit somewhere as well, but, but that idea that, you know, if you perform and you record, and, and that's where actually she would struggle and she would kind of lag, is when she, let's say she wants to record a cover song and she's doing it like 30 times and again and again and again, you know, and she just, she's just trying to nail that perfect one and it's never perfect and that demotivates her and I think it's kind of almost like a para paralysis by overanalysis kind of type of situation. And uh, I think, I, I can, I'm, on, I'm only guessing, but that's where I want to hear your opinion, but then when you are, it could be so liberating to just jump in there and sing and even feel, and it's actually something I'm doing with my videos uh, during this period on my new channel. I started doing one takes. I don't make a script. I don't, you know, do editing afterwards. And if I fail, I fail. And, but what's interesting is that I started noticing that the more I do it, the more comfortable I become at those one takes. And then uh, there's more flow to them and I'm kind of becoming pretty good at them. Uh, well, initially there was a bit of a struggle, but it's so liberating to, to have that. And, and there's actually some quality which is developing there. So, so would you say there's some similarities there with singing in terms of trying to be perfect and demotivating yourself that way? And, and here you're kind of putting yourself on the line without that much filtering. Yeah, I'd say, well, in, in this particular situation, um, that's not particularly stressful for me, but I do go on YouTube and do exactly what you said. So I do record uh, covers or, or like um, like opera karaoke kind of things. And it's one take. And I'm often not happy with it. And I like I, I know people are going to hear these flaws, you know. Um, not everyone, though. I think not everyone. I think that's kind of the thing. <laughs> Not everyone. And the funny thing is that the ones who, shall we say, haven't walked the path, oftentimes they miss. I was like, how could you miss what I'm doing really wrong here? And you're, you're, you're talking about something totally invented, you know, that you like you you just want to try to get to me and you're looking for something. Um, and, and in the case of, of uh, singing in, in classical music and opera, they actually have uh like a platform where they go and they all decide on what their criticism is going to be and then they show up on your channel and they and and not just on your channel so they figure out um where all your social media accounts are and and they will find you in all these places and make it seem like 20 or 30 people or whatever are all have this opinion of you that's kind of the dark side empire stuff. It's so dark. They make sock puppet accounts and they, it's extremely abusive. And I've had people come to me say like, what just happened? How are these people telling me about social media posts I made on this other platform? Um, and they, they get a little bit freaked out and I'm like, welcome to classical singing. <laughs> wow. Terrible. Uh, yeah. And the result is most people just don't want to engage. Um, and yeah. And so online we have this culture of, it, well, it's just like this broken culture. Um, and, but now we're stuck in this situation where online is kind of the only thing. Um, so yeah, in our, uh, in our chat group, it's called the vocalist chat hub. We don't have this pressure and that, that part is actually alleviated by, um, every, uh, every so often all of the rooms get zapped and deleted. And although people who were in the room at the time could theoretically go and find the old chat before we delete it, we give it like a really hard to search name you know, like Zajizu or something. <laughs> it's just like something that you're, you're not going to remember. And those chats get buried and buried in someone's um, feed and they've been kicked out of the room after that. And so they, you know, they can't 
respond to chats and and then everyone who wants to continue with the group has to say so um they they have to go and we call it the roll call and they have to present for roll call or they're not going to be added back um and we feel like that helps it not turn into a cult because if you if you just keep adding people back then there's a question well if they didn't come back like why didn't you come back um so we we don't allow that to happen by for for us the natural conclusion is you won't come back um and while that's easier than what i'm doing by going on youtube and putting myself out there um for them for for most people out there that's already a, it's already a lot more pressure than they're getting by you know not singing to anybody and the idea is to just get them over that fear uh and they they will have some breakdown of their abilities when they go to hit record you know especially if they just told someone that they know what they're doing uh so suddenly like uh <laughs> suddenly you have to deliver on what you said yeah i guess that's moments i had those moments with the martial arts community and my main martial arts journey channel where I would get these keyboard warriors who would just go on and on with all these ideas. And I'm thinking, especially when I learned some combat sports, I'm like, if that guy was here next to me, I'd say, just, just go on the ground, show me, you know? And, and the conversation would so quickly run out the window. And actually interesting too, um, I was, yeah, I was uh, editing, we, before we recorded, we spoke about Matt Thornton, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert and who's very much about critical thinking, applying critical thinking. And uh, I was editing one of his videos and uh, he was answering Q&A, like say, answering questions. And he mentioned that in some school, like, like he mentioned one of his examples, Aikido, he would come in and then next to him, they would say, oh, Aikido is not a martial art, it's not for self-defense and we're just practicing for health benefits. But as soon as he would leave the room, somebody else without that experience would come in, they'd be like, oh, this is, yeah, this is pure self-defense. So, you know, when they know that they will be challenged, they keep their mouth shut. So I guess it's a little bit similar here, right? It's, it's so similar that I excerpted that part of your video um, and, <laughs> and edited it together. And it, it, was, it was a post called, uh, I forget what the name of the post was. Um, something about like what, what it's like to argue with voice teachers. Um, and he was talking about the kinds of pseudo argument. And it was something like, um, uh, it works. Um, well, it, okay, maybe it doesn't work like that, but it's valuable. Yeah, right. It's kind of breaking down and breaking down and breaking down, right? Yeah. So the third one was, well, you're an asshole. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, just last resort. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Uh, well, I'm curious to ask, how was your experience on uh, putting yourself on the line on YouTube, especially when you're part of a culture which apparently is very judgmental and very picky? So to go there and do those one takes and put stuff out there where you know it wasn't perfect, it maybe wasn't up to your standards, but you've did it numerous times. So how was that journey? What, what, what did you go through internally and did something change during it? Well, so the, the thing about these people is it's this kind of objectification, right? Where um, you're visible there and you're out there with your face, your name, your voice, they're anonymous. And you'd think if you just know that that this is bullshit you know if you just if you just tell yourself well you know i understand these guys are probably really insecure they can't do any of the stuff they're talking about blah 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 that doesn't matter it's still something like taking a liver shot every time you read it um it and even if you if you block you know somehow you you got your guard up that's going to cost you something it's not it's it's uh there, there's no infinite capacity it's always a finite capacity to defend yourself 
um, and I noticed I had to be careful about when I read this stuff because if I read it just before I went on stage I was gonna have a bad night you know and there's this huge temptation even you know you're having a good night and now it's intermission you're in the dressing room and you're like oh let me go look at the the trolls oh yeah I've been there myself yeah, yeah and then now you're having a bad second half of your show <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, i'll just quickly jump in there uh, i uh i i what what i noticed is that when i would be more emotionally down when i would be tired not in like you know 100 percent inspired mood and th then those negative comments would get to me. Like those were the days when I was just like, I knew like stay away from the comment section. Don't read that that day. And sometimes you want, I would like, I would want to read them because sometimes there's good stuff, there's positive and it lifts me up. But it's such a gamble because in that more, you know, it's in that, in that more uh, sensitive state, I know it will get to me. Uh, but if I'm in a good mood, but maybe that also came through practice because there's so many comments I got and they became repetitive eventually. And I'm just like, I saw this, I saw that, I saw that. It just kind of runs off of me. But if I'm tired, moody, then the sensitivity is much more there. And it's like, it can be a mess. So I have to be careful about that. I guess we're sharing that experience. Yeah, and I, I have the same experience. And yeah, it's okay. Some of them get repetitive and they stop working. But the enemy, if you will, is always looking for the chink in your armor. <laughs> and they're going to find it because they're relentless. They got You're trying to... I, I like to compare it to, you know, you're trying to polish wine glasses uh, while someone is trying to fight you. And it's like, you're, you're not going to be good at the fighting. <laughs> you're not going to be good. At, you're definitely not going to be good at polishing the wine glasses. They're going to break. Um, so you have to choose one thing, but it's, but it's, it's kind of like a, um, it's a dilemma. It's like a Sophie's choice because you, you can't. You can't do both things at the same time and it, you, you can't seek to spread a good message you can't seek to talk about truth and at the same time be disingenuous and at the same time just just be out to hurt people um so you're gonna get hurt and that's uh, but you know i step every time i can step on stage and go <laughs> at least it's not youtube <laughs> wow so that's like, is it, is it, did I got that right? The stage for you is now like a less challenging level than YouTube. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously I let just to clarify YouTube one takes, not like perfect recording. Yeah. yeah. But how was it? Uh, did you feel like a sense of liberation though, to go through that and to, to just, yeah, yeah? yeah absolutely. It's, it's something um, I, I, I don't think it's something everyone, everyone should do, um, because I think some people will just get broken and, sure, yeah. and so you, you gotta be sure that you're ready. Um, and when I started doing it was when I, I was, I was doing a, a, a guest contract, which is like, um, well, it's, it's, it's what it sounds like, you know, a, a company is doing a particular show and it's mostly cast with people who are permanent members of their company. And then they bring in for, for some of the bigger parts, they bring in some guest artists. Um, and we always have it in, in opera you're never making all the artistic decisions. You have a director who's got a vision for how everything's going to look and uh, the character relationships and all that stuff. And you have a conductor who is going to be in charge of the, the way it all sounds. And at the same time, you're a soloist, you know, and so there's this, this constant negotiation for how much say that you have and um, the, the, there's this process and if you're lucky you have people who really are on your side but a lot of people make it into these not a lot of people but some people make it into these positions by using a, a really kind of narcissistic approach 
where you know they they bring others down and then try to look greater by comparison yeah and uh, this guy was uh, basically telling me how I was shit and then and that I would be excluded from um, further things from so he was he was threatening my career because I had literally said to him show me um, so the, there's this line you're not supposed to really cross if you're if you're the guy who's in charge of how it's gonna sound tell me how it's gonna sound but when you start to interfere with how I'm gonna pull that off it's crossing a line um, and it puts you in a really bad position because you're a subordinate, you know. Sure. Uh, but at the same time, if you do what the guy's telling you, he's never going to be, he's going to be even less happy because you, I mean, the guy doesn't know how to do what you're doing. Um, and you might have all kinds of reasons for not doing it his way. And it's, you, you, there's not enough time for, for you to explain that. So this one time I just said, show me. And the guy got really mad <laughs> because he couldn't show me. You know, it, it was just all fantasy that he was talking about. And um, uh, and then at the end of the conversation, he's, he's inviting me to go watch movies at his house. So it was this kind of, I felt like a, a, a dangerous manipulative process and in, in really like buddy you're barking up the wrong tree <laughs> um, and I was really crushed and uh, we had a, a three-week break actually in in the uh, rehearsals and I went and read the art of war and I went back and and you know I also got some some advice from colleagues about how I I I was I was under this uh, impression that I should be trying to show everyone how uh, I'm, I'm compliant. And he said, the more you do this, the worse it's going to get for you. And I went back and things went well. Um, and things went well because he tried to give me a compliment saying, oh, you're so much better now. You, you must have really practiced. And, and I said, no, excuse me, no. Uh, there's just a process, and I'm simply following the process, and this is just how it goes. And so I refused the compliment. Um, and I did it when we were alone, because I read The Art of War, and I, then I, I saw, ah, okay, you don't attack an enemy. An army that has no chance of escape is going to fight to the death. And I realized, yeah, okay, so if you're in a situation uh, where you have a boss and you're in front of everybody and you attack, you're going to get a fight to the death and you're going to die because <laughs> you're a subordinate. Um, and so I started, and th things went well after that by comparison. Um, and I started to get this sense like, you know, I need to start pressure testing my... So I was boxing already and I started to get the sense I needed to ramp up the pressure on my heart my my spiritual toughness if you will um, and I and I was like well where are people really awful the internet <laughs> for yourself like the worst yeah so I started to just go go online and try to explain my thoughts about singing. Actually, I just wanted to talk about footwork because it's really fundamental to me. If you expect to be able to move on stage, you gotta know what to do with your feet. And if, if, if you want to, I don't know, if you've ever observed your breath as you walk around and stuff, you might notice that everything you do with your body changes the way you breathe um, and vice versa. So, and if you're, if you're trying to hold a, 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 not break your posture, for instance, and you blow out all your air, it's, it's about to get a lot harder not to break your posture. Um, and because your whole breathing system is part of your posture system as well. 
um, you know, and if you lift weights or something, then you, you're going to have some opinion from an expert about what to do with your breath. They, may, they might say one thing or another, but no one's saying, don't worry about your breath. Um, and and I, I knew if I went online, I would find the, all, all the worst of the people who can't do anything. The, the Dunning-Kruger effect people who are very good at finding your vulnerabilities. Mm. And it, it's it's been effective. It's been painful. I've taken a lot of liver shots from doing that. Um, but I wound up making those connections with people who were really sincere. Uh, and they, they have transformed the way I approach my own singing and not necessarily through telling me about a, a new technique. It might be just, um, uh, well, show me how the uh, rock singer does that, you know, and we, we, we work on it together and uh and i offer what i can to them and the whole way i thought about singing has evolved uh, much quicker from that and my ability to navigate the my professional life evolved um due to that uh, and and it's my, my ability to be a good colleague got really increased um and uh it, it, it was the same thing of just not being afraid of conflict and often that means uh, you avoid the bigger conflict because you you take care of it early you know uh, so that that's that's the kind of pressure testing i guess that that i've done personally yeah i have to say i i just want to say that i really admire respect and encourage that uh it's it's a bit it's different levels in different situations, but I see some kind of parallels to my own journey of kind of putting myself on the line and uh, putting my reputation, my career on martial arts and uh, questioning myself again and again and, and giving, opening that space for people to eat me alive, but also taking the bits and pieces and saying, oh, actually there's some truth there or why am I having doubts about that? And, and for me, that's been years, a few years down that road, it's been such a transformation formative process which if, if I haven't exposed myself I would have never transformed in so quick such quick and efficient ways although as you said like it was painful there were difficult moments I had to deal with but putting myself down the line was was probably the bit, one of the best things I did in my life and what what's interesting too is even these days uh, now I'm on this new journey of creating a new channel and uh, sometimes I already go on record and say that it's it's not an easy path. It's a bumpy road. You know, the, the easy way would be, I already established myself. I questioned myself and exposed myself and et cetera, et cetera, on the martial arts journey. But it also, I became comfortable there. Like I was like, for the past few months, I was just like, I kind of know what to expect and I know what the subjects are and I could keep digging them and kind of clarify them. But, but I was living a chill life and part of me didn't, like that part of me intuitively I felt something is off about that and now when I embarked on this new journey it was there was much uh I, th I thought there will be adversity but there was much more than I thought and part of me panicked and was like holy shit what did I get myself into you know but the other side of me I started to see the potential in there because now I'm again I'm on the line where I have to do my best I have to reevaluate what I think is true and what works and what doesn't work. It's like, I, I feel like I'm, I, I had ideas on what works on YouTube per se, for, for, for example, and uh, they definitely applied to me on my martial arts journey channel, but there were some things I wasn't aware of that I was doing right. And now when I'm doing the new channel, uh, I'm like, why isn't it going so smoothly? And then I suddenly realized, oh, actually, look, I did that thing good in the chat on my main channel and I didn't even realize that and so, so just so many insights come from putting yourself on that hard path and while it's not easy a big part of me and especially now since slowly the the, sh the kind of the the it's shifting towards the positive direction uh, but I can recognize that I'm so grateful that I'm on this path because again I, I wouldn't have learned so much that I already learned in a few months just by being in that kind of turmoil uh, situation. So I, I presume that's uh, similar with your journey, right? Well, um, 
you know, I, I started, my YouTube channel is called Mr. Opera. Yeah. And it actually started uh, because there was a channel at the time called Mr. Opera. Um, that was the foundation for a, a, a kind of, um, it, it was the, this, the gathering point for this culture of bullies, just really awful people who were abusive to a lot of my colleagues and their whole notion is that, um, all the, all the modern singers from today are trash. Uh, and they're big fans of these old recordings of opera that I have to say, I'm also a big fan of these recordings and I, I don't really care for the new ones. Um, but at the same time, I understood from actually being on the path that it doesn't have a lot to do with the singers. There, there's, there's some of it. Okay. The, the performance, has changed a little bit of, of how we sing, but the biggest differences are just the recording technology and the way that that's leveraged to, to make recordings. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I saw their channel, I was like, Oh my God, it's, it's like they, they start with a good point and, and then it's just the bullshit goes from there. Mm -hmm. And they're also, doing exactly what you should do if you want the art to suffer even more. Yeah. So we went for a situation from a situation where being an opera singer was like really high paying job with a lot of uh, cultural relevance. So yeah. you were like a really important person if you were an opera singer. Yeah. And Today, the job pays a lot less and it's not so culturally relevant. And now if you add to that situation, oh yeah, and you're also going to get trolled really hard by a bunch of Dunning-Kruger. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh, I don't know what's the, what's the word for that. The Dunning-Kruger um, effect. Yeah, but someone who embodies a particular effect is a uh, poster child, if you will. <laughs> So if, if you step out a little bit and you look at the macro effects, the overall effect of what, what is going to happen from a channel like this is that the job becomes even more thankless and less attractive. And if you keep applying that over time, you're going to push the level down even more. And at the same time, the fans are often people who want to do this job themselves. And they're sabotaging themselves with the attitude that they had, which is the same attitude I had when I was 22, you know, and it's part of the culture, I guess. Yeah, I was, you know, winning the big competition and it's part of the culture, part of also being, uh, you know, I hate to say it, um, but men in our culture are really coddled. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, the, I'm just thinking about the word coddle. Uh, coddled it's, means uh, it's it's like um, they they don't have pressure testing, <laughs> okay. uh, especially yeah. in in music. So when I was uh, a young artist at at the Metropolitan Opera, for instance, the women who were my colleagues and my age were much more mature than I was emotionally, mm. because. Uh, they weren't treated like they were so special, you know, they, they had to, well, one, they, they, they had to put up with the general, um, aspects of our culture that is less kind to women than it is to men. And right, yeah. that's just the way things are. Um, yeah. men, a, a man could be, you know, 300 pounds and it's not a big deal. And if a woman is uh, 250 pounds, that's all anyone's going to talk about. And, uh, well, not all anyone's going to talk about, but it's always yeah, going to, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's always going to come up. And so, and if she's beautiful, it's the same thing. It's, it's like, <laughs> she, that's always going to come up. Uh, and when you're an artist, that's really, 
depressing. It's re it's really annoying. Um, yeah. And the 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 women I was working with all had this level of maturity that was so much higher than mine at the time. Um, and this this um, channel that I started fighting was particularly attractive to young men. Mm. And so they and they participate in these attacks on often on women. You mean attractive in a dad way, right? It's like they're they're attracted they're, they're attracted to the culture, yeah. Um, and they're also targeted by by the group for a kind of recruitment. It's a, a little bit like if you think about the skinheads or or these kinds of groups. There's a certain type dark they go stuff. they go after. Yeah, it's dark stuff. They go after these kind of insecure young men who feel like they don't have a place in society. Who? Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that sounds like movie material. <laughs> yeah, and this channel was called Mr. Opera, and they're all anonymous. Yeah, that that helps. Yeah, they're, and they're so fun. I I got the idea. Well. I, I want to find out who they are. <laughs> and as I started to get close to their identities, they changed the name of their channel. Um, and so they gave it a new name. This is Opera. And I think one of the main guys I was hunting down started to distance himself because anyone who is exposed as being part of this would be basically, I mean, it would it'd be really hard to show up for work and be like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm the guy who authored that video talking about how you sound like the Bee Gees or, or whatever. Yeah, right. Not that any of them could sing like the Bee Gees can, which would, you know, they're yeah. just like highly yeah. skilled performers. <laughs> um, and uh, so it looked to me like they were trying to branch off into two channels. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, Mr. Opera was free. And so I thought, oh, this will be a mega troll. I <laughs> I renamed my channel Mr. Opera. And um, I, I wound up having like a few weird moments where someone they bullied would come after me thinking I was the guy who bullied them oh, yeah, yeah. because of the mistaken identity. But my plan was to rehabilitate the name. Because it, it was a right, yeah. it was a catchy name, and mm -hmm. so nice, it's a great name. Yeah, I agree. And it it was it was really associated with bullying, and mm -hmm. and with hurting people. And I knew if I go and and start encouraging people, and mm -hmm. and trying to you know, so I'd go around just just leave messages of encouragement when people did post something on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And they get this and they're like, what what? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Opera likes me. <laughs> this is <laughs> <laughs> shocking. Yeah, no, but that, that's that's a cool, it's a cool approach. It's a cool story. Mm. Yeah. At the same time, I would be diluting their ability to bully people just by kind of messing with their branding. Um. Yeah. Well, um, one thing I also wanted to add and ask is usually I recognize that change or an active attempt to make a change uh, most of the times comes from a sense of frustration of being dissatisfied you see some type of injustice or you see that something is off and that creates that energy to, to do something about it and we kind of spoke uh, around that subject of what frustrated you or the dark sides of the music realm or opera singing uh, so but if you would have to kind of narrow it down and uh, crystallize and clarify what that frustration for you was like what what was specifically that what's the core of the frustration that you had which led you to your journey i have to give that some thought um you know i i i really that this is kind of hard to, to talk about but when when i started boxing um, the hard part for me wasn't getting hit, you know, actually I, like I, I would get hit and, and I'd be really surprised. Like that doesn't, 
feels it's not like as bad, right? it's not as bad as I thought, and I kind of had a thrill yeah. from it. Like I, I wanted to do it again. Mm -hmm. I, I liked getting punched in the face as well after years of not having that. So I, I, I resonate with what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, but the first time I hit someone in the face, I went home and cried afterwards. Because it brought up some really intense memories that when I was, um, when I was a young kid, we moved from Canada to the United States. And when I arrived, I was like a really fit, whatever my age was, um, for, for the fourth grade. Um, because in Canada, our, the, the culture was a little bit different. You know, we didn't, we didn't have school lunches. Everyone had to bring their lunch in a brown bag. And your mom would give you like healthy stuff to eat. And I was very secure in my place socially. And so I was a really, you know, mentally healthy, regular kid and a popular kid. And then we showed up in the United States and I was the foreign kid and they were feeding us like hamburgers and French fries for lunch. And I developed a taste for it. I put on a lot of weight and I started to get bullied. And my response to being bullied was to become a bully myself. And it's, it's, there's a situation that develops sometimes where you have a, a, a kid that's getting bullied in one instance who becomes a bully in a different instance. And it brought all that back for me. Um, and then when I saw these bullies and the way they were operating online, it's, it's, it made like a white hot rage <laughs> um, a very very intense frustration and it, it was yes about seeing them bully someone else and and it makes me feel compassion for the person getting bullied okay but I understood what they were doing to themselves when they were engaging in that behavior and that made me absolutely I, I just I said you know, I, I just couldn't stand watching people do that to themselves because I know in 20 years or something, um, if they're like me, it's all going to come back or even worse if they're, you know, if they, if they're never aware of them, of what happened, you know, and why they could be ruining their lives in ways that they don't even fathom yet. Um, and that, that's, that's exactly, that's what it was. Uh, I think one of the things which I appreciate you saying is it's kind of a mature perspective to because we often as a, as a society we tend to judge it's it, the easiest thing is to judge you know those douchebags are judging other people but then there's people who judge the douchebags but then that's kind of that vicious circle when nothing really evolves but to kind of take that one step forward and interesting enough that's kind of the core philosophy of Aikido, which not always is communicated well, but that's one of the good things I took it took away from it, is that maturity to understand that under those conditions, you could easily be that person as well, that douchebag, without even recognizing it. And sometimes they don't even realize how much bad, negative impact they have towards those people, or the world can switch and they may end up in that same spot the next day and there, there's so, so many parts to this and uh, I think yeah it's, it's great to, to kind of bring that subject up and to educate everyone not only the people who are getting bullied but also the bullies themselves and uh, interestingly enough I kind of explore that subject a little bit I'm actually enthusiastic to explore it more but in Lithuania the country I live in and where I'm originally from uh, bullying in schools is a huge problem and I was invited a few times to talk in, into schools with children. And uh, I'm not like necessarily qualified to talk about bullying. That's not like really my area of expertise, but I, you know, I gathered my best experience and, and knowledge from life experience. And I thought like what I can give and, and my intuitive kind of leaning was actually not to talk, not as much to uh, the, the bullied kids, kind of a bit about with them as well, but but part of me wanted to focus on the bullies and to, to tell them like, 
look, like, what the fuck are you doing, guys? Like, do you really want this? Do you realize what impact you have? And not to kind of, you know, be the, not to patronize them, but to level with them and to try to get them a few steps forward and to make them think and to realize that internally, I don't really think that's what they want. It's kind of a, some sort of dysfunction that they developed because they are not confident or, or they were traumatized. Like there's all these levels, but to make them think and realize that it's not as simple as I bullied someone and then I feel powerful at the moment and that's the end of the story, but there's so much more to it. So it's, it's kind of a big subject, but, but yeah, I think it's, it's great to, to bring that to light. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's probably like 90% of them are don't, they don't really want to be doing this. There, there is that ten percent though, or, or I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what the number <laughs> is. Daters. Yeah, and um, and I think it's important to, to what what I do is I actually I try to stop and make a decision. Uh, am I negotiating here or am I fighting? Mm. And when it's time to fight, uh, I think you should fight. And when it's time to negotiate, you should negotiate. And when it's time to teach, you should teach. And then the, this is part of um, of Zen, I guess, that you, you know, if you're walking, you just walk. If you're sitting, you just sit. Yeah, you're 100% um, into the, committed to the thing you do, right? Yeah, and, and so in that sense, um, it's like this capacity that we have for being a little bit ruthless um we shouldn't imagine that it's just them you know that the the reason maybe it pisses us off is because we have that same capacity uh and i'm not sure it's necessarily so that you should never use it uh, you know i i think that there's a, there's just is a question of timing <laughs> and when you're using it to help your insecurities then that's really dangerous. But if you're using, if, if you're fighting to defend someone or something like that, you should do that well. You know, that's maybe controversial. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm with you. I can, I can see that. And uh, I'll, there's one thing, one moment where you kind of mentioned in the beginning of the conversation, and it was on the top of my mind, that idea that uh, if, you can be a peacemaker if you're confident in your own self. Like if you know how to hurt people, not necessarily like if we're talking about especially like physical level, if you know that you could you know, break bones and so on, that actually gives you also the capacity to be a better peacemaker if you don't use it from a dark side because you're, you're, you're powerful enough to come in and to, you know, say, we're not going to do this. And, and you can use that, that, same power in a constructive way it's not all bad and i think that's where uh again i don't want to go too much to martial arts but that's where aikido guys fail is they don't have really any level of power and they are trying to be the peacemakers but but uh, a friend of mine a co and a colleague who's who's actually in both realms the aikido realm and the combat sports i think he's the first one who said that to me that you can be a pacifist if you don't know how to be a warrior, if you can, can't do real war, because if you can't do war, you're not really a pacifist. You're, it's, not your, it's not your decision to be a pacifist. You are being a... Sorry? Yeah, it's, it's just like you don't have a choice. And that's why you're peaceful and kind and calm and, you know, and all of that. But if you could kill someone, literally, which combat sports people actually can do like you can choke a person out and actually that's reality i know some people that i i know that they could kill me in 20 seconds and i could not do anything about that but oftentimes those guys are the nicest guys i know and i think part of it comes because they know they could kill you but they choose not to and, and they, they don't need to prove anything to you and and so on but if they would need to kill you they would you know, they, they are the ones who, like, they know, like, if they will have to use force, they will use it. And force, and I think that's also a line of thought I inherited from Matt Thornton, where he he's, he's not necessarily saying, in my understanding, that violence is a bad thing, that, and that's it. There are certain people who do not understand any other language than violence. 
Like there's certain people that the only thing that will stop them is violence. That's the only language they understand. And if you're going to try to talk to them, you'll be nice and you'll be civilized. They will destroy you. But if, if that's where you need to sometimes be the ruthless, violent person yourself, and, and there are appropriate times for that. So I think if, if I understand your line of thought, I think I, I'm with you there. Yeah. And the, the guys you're talking about also are, are it's like this, they're the safest ones to spar with, the safest yeah, ones to roll yeah. with, because they're going to have the capacity for showing you your mistake in a, in a way that sticks. <laughs> You'll really understand. Oh, yeah, my legs aren't working right now because I left myself completely open over and over again. OK, I get it. But another guy in the gym who's not quite at that level might really hurt you, you know, so he might break your rib or something because he he doesn't have the con that same control. Um, and that leaves you able to, you know, not hesitate. You can hit someone twice as hard as they hit you when they were just probing. And, and, and then they understand, OK, don't hit this guy. Uh, and that gives you an opportunity if you watch their eyes and I'm, I'm thinking more about socially, um, you know, when people are hitting people. Um, but if you're that guy who knows how to, how to handle that and they come for you and you show them that it's really not a good idea and you watch their eyes, normally they start scanning the room immediately for the next person. And if you watch to see who they zeroed in on, you, you can just go stand next to that person. It's, it's really, you know, <laughs> it's that simple. And uh, the, the only dilemma I have is that it's not a dilemma, but it's, it's a little bit depressing, I guess, that it doesn't fix anything. Uh, you, you can maybe protect two or three people in the room or and, and even if the whole room starts to act like a team, and not let anybody become the you know the the sick sheep or the, the the sick animal in the herd that gets taken by the predator. That predator is just going to find someone outside the room, elsewhere in their life. And that's that's the it, it. Sometimes I feel like it's like it's just all hopeless. You know, you can't really do anything to fix anything. You just move the problem over. But I don't know. I think. Um... I, I do realize and agree that sometimes it feels hopeless. But I think that's probably why you said sometimes it feels hopeless because it's not. And, you know, that's, that's uh, being on that whole realm of being a critical thinker and uh, criticizing or, or kind of questioning publicly some of the subjects currently in the martial arts realm and getting a lot of crap for that. Uh, also, because it's been a few years, I also got some really positive stories and and some of them were which were really inspiring to myself personally where somebody would reach out to me and they write me an email of saying that actually they initially hated my guts you know they they couldn't stand me and 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 they were trying to bash me to pieces but eventually they started to think you know what maybe there is something there and and after a couple of years they actually transformed and and change their mindset and even you know apologize for, for whatever they said before but initially like when you meet them at that initial stage of cognitive dissonance where they hate your guts it can feel hopeless it, it can feel like holy crap nothing is changing here but but then uh, sometimes it just needs time like the transformation that's kind of what i told to myself the transformation very few people i think have the capacity and the the strength to change on the spot usually people need time you know, even if you like clash and you have a huge, like, I hate, you know, I hate you, I hate you and you're stupid and da, 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 da. And then it feels like nothing changed, nothing happened. Still afterwards, there's a chance, there's an opportunity for that person to think and be like, you know, maybe I was wrong. And you, and probably they'll never tell you. <laughs> you're never going to even hear about that. But it doesn't mean that didn't change. So I think it's, it's important to kind of recognize that side of things too. Yeah, and in, in my life, when I've had these kinds of moments where I realized the, the person that I was hating was really just trying to help me, it's usually not something that person did. It's something someone else did. 
so it's a, it's a little bit like it, well it is karma but um it's a, someone someone else might be kind to me or it might be that i hurt somebody else or something like that mm. but some some other event causes me to go back in time and revisit what someone else had told me and i start to think you know that guy was probably right um so that actually that makes me feel good that you yeah, right. You, you know, it's, it's interesting because I do remind myself that I do try to consciously remind that myself all the time, and especially these days with, again, I keep mentioning, but it's, you know, the, the current process I'm going through my, my personal journey of starting a new project is uh, in terms of specificalities, uh, I'm so used on the martial arts journey channel to get a lot of views and to see people comment and there's a conversation going and, and the feedback is quite quick comparatively. I still don't know any, everything and so on, but, but I get that kind of feedback, feedback loop. But with a new journey, I'm publishing stuff and things are taking their time for people to, the way I interpret it, to, for people to trust me and to, and to open themselves up and to say what they think and how they feel. And it takes time to, to experience those transformations. And the views are way lower than I'm used to. But I have to remind myself all the time and to say that, you know, the, fa the fact that nobody commented, let's say, on that specific video doesn't mean that did not impact someone. Or if it's like 100 views instead of 10,000 views, it doesn't mean out of that 100 views that there's no, maybe there's that one person who listened to that and that was like a crucial moment for him. And maybe that, even, that person even told me that, didn't even tell me that, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen. And the confidence that I have of saying that to myself and not only just, you know, making myself believe, but actually just reminding myself that it's true because I've been in numerous situations in the past and even like through this journey already, there are some times when there's no initial feedback, but there's some moments where I get that message, I get that email and somebody's like, oh, wow, that was so great. And it took a while for me to learn about that, but it happened even without my knowledge. So I know that, that those transformations happen. It's just, as I said, I keep have to remind myself, don't expect to always be rewarded and to always learn about that. That don't, don't always expect to get the feedback. Just trust it, you know, and trust the process. It's, it's important for myself to remind uh, and remember as well. Well, th uh, thanks for reminding me because I, 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 yeah, I do tend to get down about that sometimes. Not all the time. It's it's like it it really it's what you mentioned about being tired, and uh, it, I mean that that just really has a lot to do with it. It's like when I'm physically tired, I'm spiritually tired, and there's no um, yeah. It it's it's all one thing, I guess. Uh, just one second. I'm I'm gonna grab my my hoodie because I'm. I'm jealous of your. I'm starting to get chilly, and I'm jealous that you're wearing a hoodie and I'm not. <laughs> it's a uh, mushroom themed hoodie. Nice. You seem to be fond of mushrooms, from what I see. My 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 hobby is um, uh, collecting mushrooms, and um, so I I have I have like a, a massive collection in the other room of dried mushrooms. Oh. Um, Fun gourmet wild mushrooms and stuff, um, and that's that's another one of. It's another one of the disciplines that have really helped me actually. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, when you when you go out picking mushrooms, you you're kind of taking your life into your own hands because there are certain mistakes you could make that would be really deadly, um, and when you want to identify the thing there's no subjective truth going on it's it's everything is completely objective you know it's yeah. that or it's not that there's no um but oddly <laughs> yeah but oddly if you go into the groups that are centered around mushroom hunting and mushroom identification you see the same damn things of people who haven't they don't really know what they're talking about and they will argue with a very qualified and reputable expert 
that yeah. no, it's not that because that does, totally doesn't look like that. And they've invented their own way of identifying mushrooms. <laughs> it's just like what? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to. There's kind of a line of thought that uh, we were still on, and I just wanted to add a couple more points to that. Uh, that whole journey, I just wanted to emphasize and partly because as i said you know i'm going through my own process myself right now too but one of the books i read which was actually very timely uh, it's called the dip by a very well-known marketing expert seth godin and it's a short book i actually bought the audio book it's like an hour and a half so i was like luckily it cost only five dollars but i was like oh that's it <laughs> but uh, but it's very good it's like a very good message in a short format and the message is and he's like, again, like top, top level expert of marketing and entrepreneurship. And he says that every path that's worth going through, especially in like establishing yourself in a career or, or a business, uh, that there is going to be a dip, like it's an inherent part. Uh, and the dip basically is like initially you start and you're enthusiastic and it's interesting and it's new, but then you get the dip where suddenly everything starts to feel like it's st still and nothing moves and nothing changes and you're kind of doing things, but, n but there's no effect. And uh, when I read the book, why, why I resonated with it so much is because I, I looked back at my, my journeys. I, I did like I took on a couple of big challenges on my life, like becoming an Aikido instructor against the odds, then the martial arts journey channel. And I remember that there were those dips. I was just, I just got so comfortable with being uh, successful by the end of it that I kind of forgot about those dips, but they were there. And now that I'm taking on a new journey, I'm like, oh, it's just the dip. And, uh, and it, it's nice to hear from someone uh, uh, expertise, with expertise to say that, it's it's a part of the process. You cannot avoid it. It's not a thing. It's not a reason to stop. You know, you have to push through. And 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 it's it was also cool what he was saying in that book that uh, the bigger the dip, the more it means you will get the reward later. Because people and I, I agree with him 100 percent. Because people we as people we don't like to get hurt. We don't like to suffer. And usually we avoid places where they're suffering. And the dip is painful. It's painful to live through that process. But then that means a lot of people will never go down that path. A lot of people will drop away. And those few who will go through the other side, they will, and they will suddenly get going up again. That's where significant things will happen. That's when exceptional things will happen. And, and, and obviously it applies to me myself, but when I'm thinking about your journey and, and your, your work that you're doing right now publicly, maybe there is a dip right now you know, kind of having that adversity and resistance from, from the status quo. But also, I have a feeling that you're, personally, I have a feeling that you're in the right path and, and there's something really amazing down the road. Already there are signs of success, at least from what I hear. But, but uh, yeah, for me, it just feels like, oh, yeah, there's, there's some good things coming. Well, at least in my opinion. But I just felt like I can't skip and not say that. Well, I feel one one thing that's that's maybe going to help is that it's you know I, it's I almost feel compelled to do this anyway. <laughs> uh, I I know that I could step away any time, um, but I don't feel like I actually can. There, there's just something um, you know I get tired and then but then I wait a couple of days and and I just I can't stay away from it. Um, and at the same, you know, and people ask me sometimes, how can I get into the career? Because they're not thinking about the YouTube stuff that doesn't impress them. Like, uh, sub, sub 900 subscribers isn't going to get you any questions about how to do it. Um, but they find out that I'm on stage singing singing opera which is already it's it's hard to get into the business right yeah. um and my dip in in opera was it led to living in my car so things got so bad at some point that um I, you know i had no work and i was i was like uh, 
picking mushrooms and selling them to restaurants to try to get by. Oh, smart. <laughs> um, but that that was like a, a three year dip in wow. in my opera singing, and mm. I had to start over with my training, but without a teacher. So just by myself, I had to come up with a way to train myself and then train myself and started looking after my physical fitness and then eventually my uh, spiritual fitness and all these things. Um, or emotional, psychological, we can say it's um, however people want to conceive of that. My heart. Uh, and people will say like, well, how how can I get into the business? Because what they want to hear is like, oh, yeah, just go to this place and do these auditions and follow this path that's already laid out for you and everything's going to be fine. And what I tell them is just, listen, if you're here just long enough, they have to give you a job. (laughs) (laughs) And come to think about it, basically, that's just just survive through the dip and keep going. And, and I tell them, like, don't, don't think about which, which teacher or coach you're going to find to spend your money on. Yeah, use them if they're, when they're really helping you. But I tell them, plan for a, a bunch of lean years and find any way to just hang on, uh, especially in Germany, I tell them, because the, the German... Uh, system of of uh, state funded arts is is kind of like the center of the upper business. Uh, there, there's there's more going on there than anywhere. And so for someone from America, uh, they might be expecting to like show up and sing so well that they won't have to learn German. You know, everyone will speak to me in English, and yeah. and uh, they come with ninety day visas. It's an automatic visa for for Americans. Yeah, we have the same. A Schengen visa, and, and uh, they expect that they'll be able to just pull it off like that. But everyone is coming for these ninety days, and and yeah, yeah. so that's completely saturated. And if you were that good, you'd already be getting all the jobs anyway. You know, it's that's not you. It's not me. It's not you. We're just normal people who are going to have to persevere. Um, so I tell them, find any way to be here longer than that. Do any job you can and just you just keep going. The difference isn't going to be who's who's the best singer today. It's just who's going to last. And that's how yeah. so, so basically get through the dip and it's funny, you remind me of, uh, if we keep bringing up martial arts, uh, there's uh, coach Chris Howder, uh, kind of legendary Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach who's the coach of Matt Thornton. Uh, and I think, I, I don't want to mess this up by, by saying the wrong word, but I think that the phrase goes that it's not who wins, but it's who survives. You know, that's, 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 that's the real deal. That's like, and kind of that relates to that as well. It's not about having that victory, it's about being long enough in the game. And, uh, and again, that's, that, that's very uh, relatable for me, myself as well right now. And uh, there's a few books I, I, I'm trying, trying to kind of find solutions for reading uh, the best books out there. And one of the books I, I read, actually, we're planning to talk a bit about YouTube off record later. So I'll, I'll say that one again, but a really good book, uh, Crush It. The best so far I read about social media, kind of creating a presence in social media. Uh, but then uh, one of the points by the guy who's considered to be the best mar- uh, social media expert in the world, his message is very similar. It's like, don't focus on uh, the results in the beginning. Like, especially like it's, it's a parallel, I think, that, that applies. Like when you post a video on YouTube per se, and I, I guess you went through the same yourself already. It's like nobody watches it. You know, it's like maybe a couple of people you know, but it's like, it's just so vast there that even like what's funny is, like even if it's the best video in the world, you can there's certain small percentage chance that it's gonna go viral. But usually it's like even if it's like a super good video, like uh, and I'll be a bit bold here, but like on my new channel, I, I'm still kind of f- trying to find the best voice and how to communicate my message and so on. So it's a trial and error process. But some of the videos I'm publishing, I know they're like quality stuff. You know, like some of them I'm like I look at them like. 
no, this is like badass. Like this, like this could be like on a high level channel and it would own the audience, but there's no audience yet. And so it doesn't, nobody cares that the video is good. You don't have that recognition or that relationship with the audience. There's no community. So it's like, you're not getting the views. And Gary Vee, the writer of the book, he, he pretty much says that as well. He's like, don't focus on the views. Don't expect to get the views early and don't think that that's a sign, sign, signifying moment to, to tell you whether you're doing right or wrong. And, and there's a couple of good phrases that I think are very, very valuable that I took as well. It's like he says, until you posted at least 50 videos, don't even like, until then, there's like, there, you don't even have a reference point whether you're going on the right path or not. You have to put in the work. And kind of his message is you put on the blinders and you just continue to develop relationships like network and put out content. You just grind and grind and grind and you don't look back and you don't look sideways. It's like, is this working? It's like, you just do it. And after a while, maybe you can change your course a little bit. You know, you can make some some fine tunements, but, but it's like, I think people are too much focused on the, whether if it works or not. And then also to, uh, uh, my, again, my girlfriend, uh, she, she's friends with sing, friends with singers. And, uh, I noticed that pattern with especially singers who want to make it, they publish a single song, you know, on YouTube, get very few views and they make, they come to a conclusion. Oh, that means I suck. No, that means my music is bad. That means nobody cares and then it's not for me. And I understand how those people feel. I can relate to them. It's, it's a tough journey, but, but that's not a, like that doesn't tell anything about you. And people focus too much on that. It's like, I failed once, I failed twice, I failed, failed three times. That means it's not for me. That's the conclusion they came to. And that's not it. You know, that there's, there's, that's, we're not talking about that. You should, I agree with you 100%, like it's all about grinding, 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 and eventually you will make it if you, you know, make the right fine tunements. But, but yeah, I think it's kind of the same subject. Yeah, and I, I feel like if you're, you know, singing is about communication. So it's, it's about like finding a relationship with someone. And, and, and in my mind, it's cooperative with, with the audience. So there's, there's only one side of this that I control and I can't do the audience's job for it. And it's same, and I have to trust that they are, they are doing their job. And yeah. if I, if I put myself out there, okay, fine. You know, it's opera. It's not, it's never going to be, um, some kind of viral revolution, but I can make quality connections with with actual people and that's it's extremely satisfying it's just um i don't know it's it's like it's like hitting a golf ball just right or something like that. it's just... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with you there too and just i think it's probably my last thought from the books i usually don't like to quote too much but it, it definitely made an impression on me and and again seth godin in one of his books, I, I read numerous, a bunch of them recently, but one of them, he tells a story of his friend asking him, how do I market my new book? And he kind of gives this controversial idea, but it, I think the message is really awesome. He says, sell it to one person. It's like, if you can sell your book to one person and get him enthusiastic about it, kind of get, get him hyped about it, then it means... Sooner or later, down the road, you will sell more books and, you know, they will spread. And, and then with bigger marketing strategy, you will reach more people. It's just a question of time. But if you can't sell it to that single person, then probably you're in trouble. And, uh, and I, I like that idea, too. And it's kind of what uh, you still have to, like, I think, you know, keep grinding. It's not like a one-time thing works, works or not, and that's it. But I remind myself that to myself, too, is like when I release a video... When I'm used to bigger views, now I get less views, but then uh, that's not the thing. But if that's not the, the point of attention that, that should be there, if, if even if one person gets enthusiastic about that video and somebody's like, oh, that's such a good video, part of the mind can be like, oh, it's just one person. Like, uh, it, it means nothing. 
But no, actually it's the opposite. If you got one person invested into your video, into your song, into your you know, content, then that means sooner or later more people will go along as well. And uh, I don't want to put too much, you know, stuff about my girlfriend. She's not in the video and it's best not to talk, you know, about people when they're not here. But, but I think it's a valuable lesson. Uh, and I reflected about her journey. She did publish a video clip of like a really well-made, good song and everything. And she got a decent amount of views and, and a, a handful of people who are super enthusiastic about it. But she also, for a while, she was uh, famous in our country because of those, you know, kind of American Idol things. And, and, and then she, she looked and she was like, oh, it's a failure, you know, and I wasn't smart enough at that day to say, no, look, there's like 50 people who are enthusiastic, but she was expecting, you know, 5,000 people to be enthusiastic. And then for her, it was a failure, but actually in reality, it wasn't, it was the wrong point of attention. So I think it's, it's important to scale down and, and to look at those small victories. And, and as you said, they can be so gratifying. Like if you're doing what you're passionate about and you get that one victory and, and you're humble enough to receive it, then you can create the hype that you need to keep going versus, versus if you're all about numbers and, and big time success straight off the bat, probably you're going to have trouble. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, I'm pretty much ready to wrap our conversation, but uh, the very last question I wanted to ask, uh, it's kind of a challenge question, uh, which I like to ask for the very end. The whole conversation we had, if you would have to summarize it in a short version, what would your summary be of the conversation? I, I guess it would be that, um, that comfortable doesn't make a change. You know, we're talking about pressure testing and we're talking about this and that and and that, that feeling of irritation from from wanting something to change. And I think today a, a lot of people expect to, to be comfortable and change things at the same time. And they freak out when they're not comfortable. <laughs> and you should throw a party instead, you know, you should, you should kind of celebrate that. And it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. It means like you're, I think it means you're doing something right. And we've, we, we've gone so far being comfortable, I think, with, with our, with our whole culture and society. And I think we're starting to see more and more people realizing that that's not so helpful um, and that if you don't change eventually time's going to catch up with you and so I, I guess it would be that that the, you know comfortable doesn't change anything <laughs> nice cool and the, the very last part for going off record uh people who want to find you the group uh, or your online lessons, like what's, what's the contact point? Post the links. Um, the, the vocalist chat hub is a, that's a free, uh, group on, on Facebook. Uh, something, I guess we, you could call it co-learning. So there's, there are a bunch of really, really brilliant experts who hang out there. Um, but you're also there just to just to be together with other people who are engaged in learning about their voices and singing. Um, you can find me on the Mr. Opera channel on YouTube. And, um, and if you, if you go there, you can find me on Skype and, and, you know, various other places. Um, I'm easy to find on Facebook. My, you know, I use my, my real name and, um, um, I can, we can put my Skype address or whatever. I don't mind uh, taking those calls and it's classical singing. So it's not that many of them anyway. <laughs> nice. Well, good. Uh, so before we go off record, I uh, want to say thank you again. Uh, I personally really admire 
and and very appreciative when uh, you get together with a person who's open to talk about you know the ups and downs. I think I keep seeing on my new journey that we're so focused on the positives. It's like, oh, look at me, I'm successful here, and this was good for me, and and we all have shit in our lives, but not everyone has the the courage and openness to talk about it. So I think I really appreciate when we can have those conversations. I think people who will have the mental focus to listen for the com- full conversation will benefit from it very much. So so thank you for that. From, from, from me too. I mean, thank you so much. Um, I, like your, your channel, the, the one, okay, I know, I know we're moving on to a new thing now, but <laughs> that's still there though. <laughs> uh, martial arts journey, uh, you had a huge impact on my life and I've spoken to many other people who when I when I bring up I, I, I might say like oh you should check out martial arts journey just for basic basic um, thoughts about what pressure testing is and and you know a compelling story and they go oh Roca and they go oh Rokas yeah <laughs> <laughs> I know him yeah and so you, you've I think you've really inspired a lot of people um, and you, I mean, I mean, you got the views and everything. You probably know about that, but um, when I talk to people one on one, it's it's often a, it's the same thing. It's like a big change in the way that they thought about themselves and the world, and uh, what it means to to want to be good at something, you know. And yeah, so that's a real <laughs> privilege for me, I would say. Thank you. I think I actually really appreciate saying that. I think I think sometimes people presume it's like, oh, you know, he knows. But to be honest, it's it's always if I hear that, it, it means a lot to me. So so thank you for sharing that.